Right, good evening, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Black Country Society was formed in 1968, and uh, about two years later, various subcommittees were formed to cater for people's various interests. I'll just give you some examples. The, uh, there was a drama group which dealt with entertainment, organised brass band concerts in the Black Country, of course, and comedy shows. Uh, Enoch and A-Line, things like that. And then there was another group, Town Planning and Conservation, that dealt with that, which uh, did very good things actually early on. Another one, Tape Recording, which recorded the uh, dialect and uh, the various sounds in the Black Country. They were just fortunate to record some of the industrial sounds as they were on the way out in the 70s. Photography, very important to record the local scenes and the vanishing industry and vanishing buildings, so that was again important. Then another one, Industrial Archaeology, which is a group which uh, researches and records the uh, early trades, early industrial trades and techniques. Um, this appealed to me being an engineer and so I joined that very early on and I've been the, uh, the chairman of it for about the last 20 years or so. Um, unfortunately, all these groups have faded away uh, gradually um, and the only one really going now is the Industrial Archaeology Group. But the few keen members in the photography, tape recording, town planning and so on are, have come into our group and so our Industrial Archaeology Group now contains the town planners which comes in very useful and photography, tape recording, dialects and sound so that all works very well within our Industrial Archaeology Group. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm asked right away when I go out and take this talk out to different parts of the country, Yorkshire, down Southampton or something like that, is why did the chain industry set up and uh, concentrate in this area, this Cradley Heath, uh, Dudley area. And of course the answer to that is the availability of the uh, thick coal seam, the fuel. The 30 foot coal seam, 10 yard coal seam, which is the famous uh, 10 yard coal seam in the black country. Um, so what I normally like to start off with is a couple of slides uh, showing this uh, this coal seam and we were, an old coal miner in Old Hill once said to me that one of the most marvellous things to see is uh, this 30 foot coal seam which you'll never see it because it's underground. Having said that the Black Country coal uh, was located very close to the surface within a maximum probably about 600 feet and a lot of it within two or three hundred feet and this came in very useful just off the Pedmore Road a few years ago when in the old days they would sink a shaft and the miners would go to work and mine the coal. They, with the modern machinery and extractive uh, processes they've got today, were able to go down 200 feet, take off the clays, which of course were very useful for brick making and so on in the black country, and get the 10 yard coal seam out and take it out and uh, process it. Um, we saw this coal seam being uh, brought to light sort of thing, you know, seeing the light of day, from the canal at Netherton. Uh, and we took one or two photographs, this is just one of the, the photographs that I took, one of the slides, which shows the 10 yard coal seam um, within about 200 feet of the surface really, just off Pedma Road. Uh, this, as you can see, this is a, a marvellous scene. Uh, you can actually see water pouring out of one of the, the adits, one of the workings where our early grandfathers have so as my grandfather actually was a miner in the area, he would sort of go to work and walk through here mining coal sort of thing. Um, we thought what a fantastic opportunity to uh, record this 10 yard coal seam which normally would have been out of our reach. So I approached the people who were doing the open casting and said would it be possible for a dozen members of our industrial archaeology group to go down and take photographs, close-ups, examine the, uh, the pit props and the supports and things uh, because we are, you know, the, our job is to record the, any industrial remains of the black country and this is a marvellous opportunity. On that slide as well you can also see the marvellous layers of clay, the very light clay, very suitable for refractories and withstanding heat and making clay, clay pots for glass and things like that and the other layers for making various types of bricks. Uh, so any spoil that was brought up in the black country was also very useful for making bricks. So this is why we got, we find on the map such a, a, a fantastic amount of brickyards. Uh, usually by the collieries as well so they could use their spoil for making bricks. Anyway I approached the gentleman who was in charge of the open casting and he said uh, sorry uh, it's much too dangerous for anyone to go in there. Uh, 
there's workings below it, there's pit props all over the place, there's heavy machinery moving about, uh, anything could collapse at any moment. I said, well, we are used to this thing, we have been down mines before all over England, we would certainly like to inspect the coal seams in our own area in the black country um, and uh, we've got the right equipment and we wear the right tackle etc. No sorry he says. When I insisted he says righto he says I'll tell you what he says you get me an insurance policy to cover your men for a million pounds and you can go down uh, and of course he thought that's it I've seen the last of him but as you know you can get anything in Cradleith High Street so I went into the first insurance brokers in Cradleith High Street so I wanted an insurance policy for my men to go down well and the ladies as well actually in the group to go down into this very dangerous environment where they're open casting off the Pedma Road. £12.50 he says sir so I got a policy of a million pounds to call our, our group to go down there for £12.50. I then presented it to the, the gentleman and he said oh, I can see you're very keen he says so away you go. So we can see that we we're uh, most keen to record the industry and the, the coal seam and so we, uh, we went in several times later on. He even phoned us up when they discovered workings which were worth recording and uh, we went in several times. And I've just put one of the slides here that you can see that we managed to record. You can see the, the black uh, diamond, the coal seam, the 30 foot coal seam. You can also see uh, a working where our grandfathers would come through. You can see the supports. Uh, of the of the actual working as well. You'll also see there's lots of water coming through because this is a feature of the Black Country coal industry. For every ton of coal that was mined, 12 tons of water had to be pumped up uh, from the same shaft. That water is also, you can see, is a rusty colour. It's what they call chaley beach staining. And that shows that that water is passing over iron ore. So this is another feature of the Black Country uh, mining industry. Some shafts were able to bring up coal and the iron ore uh, all ready for the blast furnaces. Just had to be roasted and things like that. But all we wanted then was a flux to uh, help them to separate in the blast furnace and we but that was limestone which we obtained from uh, Wren's Nest, Castle Hill and that at Dudley. So we had everything we wanted. This is why the iron industry set up in the area and we made such beautiful iron suitable for the chain makers and so uh, this is why the industry more or less centralised in, in this black country area. The mining of course caused lots of problems in the area. This is a scene down Dudley Wood. Uh, you can see almost every building on that apart from perhaps a couple are leaning over. Uh, this is a feature of the black country buildings, nothing stood up straight. You can see this is Dudley Wood Road we're looking at in front of us now. The only building in the centre there that is left standing now is the Victoria Public House. Uh, all the, the rest have gone. Uh, the houses on the left, the shops on the left up Dudleywood Road, you can see itself is dipping down. Uh, one of those lasted way up into the 70s and 80s, uh, although it was leaning back about 20 degrees. The causes of the problems, well you can see on the right hand side over the other leaning house, the pit uh, uh, frame, the, head, the headgear of the pit frames, uh, one of the several mines on that area which they said would never be suitable for building houses. And of course if you go to that area today there are a large housing estates on that very site. The little mission hut in the centre there in the front has been replaced of course by St John's Church uh, and that uh, is now a little sort of graveyard. The um, Earl Dudley's Railway passed through between that building and the Victoria Inn on its way to Penn's Ironworks. The first sign that was available um, was uh, before Henry Court invented his grooved rolls in 1783. Uh, was slit iron and this is a, a good illustration of a slitting mill where the iron was rolled on the, the rolls you can see which are marked C and D, rolled into flat pieces, heated in the furnace and then slit on the slitting mill you can see on the left hand side. These were square rods usually about half inch or three eighths square or if we're talking in the modern language you know 10 millimetre or about 12 and a half millimetre square. Um, and these are okay, but if you wanted to make it chain, if you wanted to make a chain out of them, you've got to hammer it round because one of the things you need for iron to make chain is it must be round so that it flexes together very easily. Uh, so these were ideal for the nail maker. He was able to make square nails with this, but not too good for the uh, chain maker. And so a little while, a few years after Henry Court invented the groove rolls and round iron became easily available, we find that about 1800 or just after, a lot of chain firms start to be established and they're making chain with small round iron. Here we see a nail maker at work. Um, 
a nice little illustration from the uh, front cover of uh, Meccano magazine, if anyone remembers that when they were a little younger. And there you see a, a nail maker is uh, pointing a nail and then he heads it in the uh, little tool there, brings the oliver down to head it and hits that lever at the back, that uh, little lever to throw the nail out at the back. And there you can see a typical nail making uh, uh, set up, these tools that he used. Having said that, I did go up to Workley Top Forge and find that there was some chain made with square iron and you can see they've cleverly got over the friction problem by putting it point to point. So uh, the, uh, instead of the flat iron causing problems, you've actually got a very good uh, pivoting point on the point of the iron. I've been up again since, I, I, I couldn't find this uh, later on, so I don't know what's happened to that chain. So that must have been a very, very early uh, piece of handmade chain being made with the square iron. John Wilkinson was the first gentleman to take a, uh, advantage of the seam engine and uh, also set up a, a blast furnace on the plateau, on the Black Country Plateau. Before that, we had to depend on water wheel driven forges around and blast furnaces around the area driven by our rivers, such as the River Stour at Cradley Forge. Um, this is John Wilkinson's uh, first blast furnace, the mother furnace at Braidley, Bilston. Uh, I think a bit of artist license there where he's put lots of chimneys, a bit lots of smoke coming out. The little point you can just see in the hazy distance on the left is supposed to be Wensby Church. And of course Wilkinson coincided this setting up with the uh, building of the first canal, 1768-1770. Um, one of the troubles on the Black Country Plateau, we had no means of transport, not very good means of transport, no navigable rivers suitable for boats and when the canals came along at the uh, end of the 18th century, we then had boats which could transport the uh, ore in and fuel in and finished products out of the area. So this is a nice little watercolour of uh, John Wilkinson's furnace. Um, the gentleman at the right hand side is wheeling a burden up the ramp loaded with coke and iron ore and limestone. He's tipping it into the blast furnace, you can see the flame coming out of the little chimney on the top and then it's being tapped out into the um, uh, casting house, you can see the little low building just to the left of it with the three windows, top windows. Uh, you can also see this, the blast furnace, the blast is driven by a steam and you can see the steam coming out of the, the boilers uh, just to the left of the stack. You'll also see that these blast furnaces are unusual in that they've got sort of a castellated top and apparently this was because John Wilkinson was, Wilkinson was also always at loggerheads with the Earl of Dudley who had the land, some land next door. He also had limestone on the land next door but could, would, would not supply John Wilkinson with it. John Wilkinson had to go to Warsaw to get his limestone. And so in return, uh, John Wilkinson said that the Earl Dudley was always boasting about his castle at Dudley. He would put these castellated tops on his blast furnace to say that he also had a castle to equal the Earl of Dudley's. The iron that's produced by the blast furnace, of course, is cast iron, it's very brittle, it's unused, unsuitable for making chain, and so it had to be processed, it had to be puddled. All the uh, chemicals that we didn't want and the high carbon contact had, had to be driven out by puddling, a very highly skilled, uh, hot job. And uh, the, um, there you can see there, a typical puddling furnace with the, the ball, one of the balls being taken out loaded onto this very long handled trolley which would be then dashed over to the steam hammer which would consolidate it by hammering it down into a, a sort of a billet and you can see the, the shingler in front and the hammer driver have got uh, plenty of protection against the flying slag. He would then make it into a workable billet so it could be put into the first rolls to be rolled into a billet. You see they're very rough rolls and usually um, wrought iron which is the end product was usually worked three times to drive out a lot of the slag, not all of it because that is one of the qualities of wrought iron, the very minute strands of slag that are in it which gives it this sort of anti-corrosive quality and easily forgeable and well work workable quality. Uh, so it was usually worked three times, it was hammered and plated and piled and reheated and rolled again and this is where you get in the catalogues the illustration of treble best iron or best 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 iron and Noah Hingley at Netherton turned out this treble best iron and of course it was the envy of the country because it was a very fine iron, ideal for making chain, had all the workable qualities, it would weld easy and it, would, it was very anti-corrosive, ideal for making anchor chain for ships. 
This was then, of course, passed on to the rolling mills around the area that rolled it to the size that uh, the, the chain maker wanted it, whatever size he, uh, whatever diameter he wanted. And again, we were very fortunate to be invited to John Bradley's at Stourbridge when they closed down uh, a few years ago. Um, and we were allowed into this again very dangerous environment for the simple reason that they were closing down and we were told to get down there for about half past six in the morning. You can see by the forge clock it's just after seven o'clock. Uh, we then shut our films, took them into Duns at Cradley Heath and had them developed, went off to work, picked them up on the afternoon or one of our gentlemen who was a teacher at the time and then we were able to show them at our meeting on the night. So this was recorded on video and on slides and it was the last hand worked rolling mill in the black country and it's, you see it's water cooled by the steam that's passing through and of course in the behind the clock there's a very large uh, electric motor which is driving the mill uh, to drive the rolls and you can see it enters the far side as a billet and comes through gradually getting a smaller diameter and longer uh, until he finishes on this bottom side quite a long length and the diameter that the chain maker wanted. This uh, diagram uh, shows the different types of chain uh, just to put people in the picture. Um, the standard chain link you can see on the top left, well the middle left is the open link chain which is a fairly common link. When you add a stud to it which is just below it which a stud which uh, is a, the right diameter and the right fitting for that particular size of chain. The stud is put into the centre and this becomes cable chain or, or, or anchor chain and this is the only chain that, that it is used for. Um, and the idea of the stud is to stop it from tangling up when you drop your anchor. No other need for it. A lot of books say that it's put in there for strength. I can tell them that I've been on the test, test beds many times and open link chain will almost close up together when it's tested whereas a stud link chain will not close up because we've got a cast iron stud in it with, which is very strong in compression and will not allow it to close up. So really the open link chain will stand a, a larger tensile pull than the cable chain which is down below it. So that is particularly used for anchoring ships. Uh, Thomas Brunton uh, invented it in about 1813. Uh, the idea was when they started to use chain, uh, the chain which when they dropped the anchor by gravity, the chain was tended to get into a knot and if it hit the side of a ship it would take the, the side of the ship out of course in a, a cloud of rust and so the idea was to prevent this chain knotting up and so the stud was put in. It's a very early uh, standardised industry, about 1857 where they standardised the size of chain. Uh, there's lists and, and tables for various diameters but the general idea is if you make your uh, a link, the shortest link, the strongest link possible must be four and a half times the diameter of the iron that you make it with. That's easily worked out by the, the method, the, the type of links that go through it and then th three and a quarter times the diameter for the width, which is allowing a quarter of the diameter for movement. That chain is the strongest chain made. If you go beyond that, then you're weakening the chain. The chain up on the top right hand corner is a twisted chain, which the women made for agricultural use or for bag bands over horses, uh, single or double. And then below we can see an example of an electrically welded link, which uh, was invented on the continent in 1901 by Mr. Bossard. And, uh, Samuel Woodhouse at Corngreaves bought the patent to make it in this country and turned out the first chain in 1903. This is interesting because if we see one of those marvellous programmes on television um, when they were taking the uh, convicts off to Australia about 1788, uh, we see them going up the gangplank with uh, lots of chain around the ankles and wrists and unfortunately for me the camera went a bit too close and I could see that it got that little bump in the centre because electrically welded chain is 99% welded on the side, whereas handmade chain is welded on the end or the crown, up to one inch, one inch or up to, well, just under two inches actually. And so you can tell electrically welded chain by that little mark that is left when the rest of the weld is sheared off and cleaned off by the, uh, the machine. So here we are, 1788, um, people being shipped off to Australia with chain on which wasn't invented or produced in this country anyway until 1903. We can also say the same about the cable chain. If you look closely at some of these old films where the Crusaders are attacking castles, I saw one when I came home, the, my lad was watching one night, uh, or one tea time, where the Crusaders were attacking a castle and the defenders were trying to raise the drawbridge very quickly and I looked closely and they got cable chain 
on the uh, on the drawbridge, and this was about 12:56, and they got cable chain, which wouldn't have stood until about 1813. A very important point to make, I should say, about chain is the size when you're researching chain or recording it or or buying it even. Uh, the size of a link. If I said that I've been working on one inch chain today, a lot of people would think that that is one inch chain because the length of the link is about one inch. This is actually one inch chain because you're talking about the diameter of the chain that you work, that you start to make the chain with. Uh, you can see that the centre link is an open link. Uh, the top link is a cable chain with a stud in. Thomas Brunton, that's about 1813, invented that. And then the, the third link shows the production of the, uh, the chain where the scarf joint is brought together and that's the mess that they have to clean up when they weld it together. So that's a good illustration of that. And then also the women made this lovely double back, back bond, this back band, this uh, double twisted chain where two links go through each one. This went over, of course, the back of a uh, saddle tree on a horse to the two shafts to, uh, to hold the... Um, the cart, and they had to, one of their jobs when they were apprentice, they had to make a swivel so that any movement of the, the shafts would be taken up by that swivel. And so it's very important that you, when, you, when you do a back band, you have a swivel. And if anyone's worked in metal, you know that if you make a swivel like that and the metal cools down, that has still got to be able to swivel because it contracts, as you know, when metal cools down. So very important that they learn to make enough play so that that will still swivel when, they, uh, when it's uh, gone cold. And, and just the last point, the chain, when it's tested, if you say you test it to destruction, this is a piece of electrically welded steel chain. You can see the, the remains on the centre there, the, where it's been welded. This has been pulled until it's broken. You can see the links are very distorted. They've gone solid like a walking stick, uh, useless as a piece of flexible chain. Uh, but there it just shows you the force uh, when they tensile test a piece of chain. Uh, it goes that solid like that. This is a typical a chain works. This is Noah Bloomers at Quarry Bank. Uh, a typical one where you can see the, the chain makers are ring around the outside of the, the building, uh, working on Tommy hammers, treadle operated uh, Tommy hammers. Some with, still with ash bowls in the, uh, it, 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 to some convenient room above, you know, to, to form the return spring. You'll also see they've just had a nice delivery of of wrought iron in the centre. This dried up in about 76. The, this firm closed down in the winter of 76 because of the lack of wrought iron. Um, the only one metal that was available then, of course, was steel, and that could be used for the electric welding process because you cannot electric weld wrought iron. Just a sequence of films to show you the manufacture of chain. Uh, this is Sam Bloomer at Noah Bloomer's. Uh, his bar, of course, would be, put off, would be cut off by the yard man on a guillotine um, or a cropper. And uh, whatever size he wanted, again, according to the diameter, he would, they would be cut off for his length. He would heat it up in the fire. You can see concentrating on the centre part of the link so that he could do that first bend. And then he, while he's still hot, he hammers it down and forms this U-shape or horseshoe shape to form the first part of making the, uh, the link. You can see now how hot the fire is on the, on the left. It's a fire that has to heat that wrought iron up to 13, 1400 degrees centigrade to bring it up to the correct welding heat to make a correct joint. You can also see the chain he's working on at the back, which is about uh, 5 8 3 quarter cable chain. You can see how nice and tight it is. There's very little room for movement in the, uh, in the link, and this is just what we want to make a strong chain. He's using a, a correct chain maker's hammer, which is tapered on the top end and flat on the bottom. Most of his operations carried out by the flat bottom, but the scarfing operation is carried out by the tapered top. He's also using a pair of nipple tongs. He uses a pair of bending tongs to bend it, nipple tongs to do the other operations, and a pair of hollow bits to put it into the fire. So three type of tongs used by the chain maker. Here you can see um, the next operation, once you put it into the fire, and, and you must remember to, to thread it into your last link. In this case, Mick Bradney is making ornamental chain, uh, and the, the ornamental parts have been uh, cast for him, and he's joined them together with wrought iron. These were destined for the Rose Gardens, which stand in front of Cardiff Castle, and also the museum buildings and so on. Uh, and I've been down there and photographed that chain in that position. Uh, just to, to show me what happened to his end product. And you can see ornamental chain like this, they, they, they come into the black country, 
uh, to have it manufactured. Mick also, even now today, manufactures uh, chandelier hooks for the casinos in America and uh, he excitedly phoned me a, a couple of uh, three years ago um, to say that he was making some hooks for 10 Downing Street and he had to make them quickly and they had to be fitted into 10 Downing Street uh, to hold the chandeliers in there while the parliament was in recess. So again, we, they come into the black country to make these special uh, jobs. Right, so he's scarfing the, the link together so it will wrap over. This is just the same as putting a scarf around your neck and putting one, lapping one side over the other. Uh, you can see now Sam Bloomer has put the, the link over the beacon and he's turning the two ends together uh, to bring them so they're ready for welding, but they, he can't weld them at this stage. He has to put it back into the fire to bring it up to welding heat to, uh, to weld the joint. Another chain maker here, I've tried to sort of put a diversity of chain makers on, most of them at Noah Bloomers. He's, he's heated up that one end to a white, a light straw, almost a white hot heat to get it up to welding heat and he usually puts about three blows on each side so that he welds that into a correct blacksmith weld and that, um, that weld, now that join, is as strong as the rest of the link. And I've seen chain tested and if it does on the rare occasions break, it will break somewhere not the joint, somewhere in the middle, to show that it's a, a poor fault in the iron and not uh, in the joint sort of thing, you know. Uh, again, chain makers didn't uh, get paid for, uh, uh, they didn't go in and clock in like most people do to, uh, in, in most factories. They went in what time they wanted, they made chain, uh, it, they weren't paid for it until it was tested. And so this chain had to be made, put into the tested te test bed, tested to a uh, Lloyd specification for that diameter uh, and if it failed that chain would come back to him for repair and he would not be paid until that chain was uh, correct. Uh, and so you, this reared a, a very high class, very highly skilled group of men knowing that if their chain failed they got the terrible job of joining two lengths of chain together which is no fun, I can tell you that, when you're swinging two lengths of chain in to heat it up, it's no fun to manoeuvre about. And so if they thought that a weld is not taken, a joint is not taken properly, they will cut it out before it gets any farther and uh, rework it, it's no problem to rework it. The stud is added later, of course, you can see the stud is just in the front of that slide in the front and uh, that will be inserted at the last operation. There you can see now the, the, the chain has been welded. This is Clary. Of course, Clary is, uh, you can see him in operation down at Mushroom Green. Uh, Clary is cleaning up what he can of that weld before he brings down the, the, uh, the, uh, the top tool in the uh, Tommy Hammer onto the bicken at the bottom to smooth the link out. Uh, he's responsible for repairing and overhauling those uh, tools and so if he can cut down the wear as much as possible he will take out as much of that roughness on the link with his hammer as he can. Again you can see the uh, correct chainmaker's hammer there with the flat on this end and the tapered part for scarfing. And the, a good view as well now there you can see of the tommy stumps, these are the two wooden stumps which uh, hold the bearings for the tommy hammer. Um, and easily maintained and has to be maintained by the chain maker of course so his skill is to repair and maintain his own tools even that Tommy Hammer. Again this is developed from the old Oliver which I'll put a slide on in a few moments. Right so this is the chain maker's Tommy Hammer or if you go to Quarry Bank it's a Tommy Hammer as they say up there and you can see now it's a, a very simple basic machine, um, a treadle operated hammer uh, a box containing cinder and ashes with a, a block which holds the tools or a larger anvil if you're working on larger chain. Two stummy stumps all belt, bolted together you can see tied up nice and tight and uh, some easy simple bearings which can be adjusted the, the, with those eye bolts slacking off and you can move your tools into position when you change your tools because whatever chain you're working on the beacon in the block or in the anvil and the top tool in the Tommy Hammer have to be changed, the top die has to be changed to uh, suit whatever diameter of chain you're working on. And you can see I've just popped in there, this didn't happen all over the place but there's an ash pole attached to the beam which provided the return spring for the hammer to get out of the way once he'd started, uh, once he'd finished his hammering on the block that hammer would shoot off out into the vertical position so he would be out of the way for his next, uh, next link. Um, I think that's, there's also a turnbuckle you can see for adjusting the, the, uh, the spring on the, on the ash pole 
uh, left and right hand threaded uh, turnbuckle there so you could adjust it and the chain maker was usually in the habit of uh, disconnecting these um, w uh, when he left uh, or sometimes they, or they would fall over the treadle or it would rest the, the, the uh, ash pole, give it a little rest while he was away. And this, we think, came, uh, came that, uh, that saying, if he didn't come in the next day, the gaffer would look down and say that Tommy Smith hasn't come in, he's off the hooks because he hasn't connected the hooks up on his, uh, on his Tommy Hammer. And this is a, a typical black country saying when anyone's ill, they're off the hooks. And we think it came from this, uh, this uh, trade. There's an illustration of a very old Oliver, uh, I think about 1698 when uh, Robert Plott came into the black country and his natural history of Staffordshire included this uh, illustration of this fearsome machine he found at Mow Cop up on the Staffordshire border. And you can see it's just an Oliver with a F is the treadle and the large hammer and the two ash poles you can see there to bring it back into the vertical position and 10 of course is the block where he could work, do all his work. He said that he, he could actually do away with the striker. So here's the first type of mechanisation, you know, when he's doing away with a helper. You can see as he puts his foot on the treadle F, it works the, the hammer and rains blows on the block. And he can also rain small blows with the small hammer. So you see, this is quite a, a very early uh, illustration of an Oliver. I found references to them back to 17, to, sorry, 1327 in castle armories for making tools and armour and uh, weapons. Right, so uh, the Tommy Hammer is used for the last part of the operation. There you can see Sam Bloomer has put his foot on the treadle and um, he's hammering away moving it round with the uh, pair of nipple tongs to take out the unevenness on the, uh, on the link and uh, bring it back to the same diameter as the rest of the, the bar. Last operation, of course, is the, if it's a cable chain, is the insertion of the stud. You can see the stud's cold and it's been put in position and then the, the link is closed down on it into the grooves that are, are made on the sides to locate it. You can also see the side which has been welded on there, the light coloured uh, heated side, and that's, the, you can see it's, now formed into the same diameter as the rest of the link. They use that method then up to about one inch diameter, which is quite a large link really. And from then onwards they use the next session, the next type of machine, which was a dolly. If you look at the old trade boards list, you can see that they're paid for Tommy chain, dolly chain, or side welded chain. And this is a dolly. Uh, or if the women made it, they were, it was handmade, hand welded, they didn't use a machine at all, that usually up to about half inch. Uh, so there's a dolly, it's very similar to the, the Tommy Hammer, in fact, in, in that it hasn't got a, a treadle uh, or a return um, a spring or anything like that. You, the top tool has to be put over by hand by the striker, and so this, this is operated usually by two, three or four men. The smith works on this front, front end uh, doing the operations and the blows are struck from the other side by a striker or two strikers. You can see on the, on the top right there the two tools come together to form the diameter again of the chain that you're working on and just below that it's held in an open bearing and so we have the little wire cage with uh, unused links on the bottom to form a bit of a balance weight to, just to keep that uh, um, pivoting in that open bearing sort of thing. So whenever I went into nail bloomers and I could hear a jingling sound, that was these jinglers on the bottom dancing up and down as blows were being rained on top of the, the dolly tool. I knew then that this was dolly chain and it was on the way out and I must try to record as much as possible. The, uh, one of the ideas uh, of um, recording like this was that we did a visit with an industrial archaeology group to Noel Bloomers uh, in about 1972. We went into Noel Bloomers yard and I was being an engineer working to tenths of a thou. I was amazed at these gentlemen working with these very old, as I found out later, some of them 200 year old uh, implements and tools and I thought I must record as much as possible. Went into the local libraries and found that very little or nothing had been recorded. So this was a task I set myself that I must record as much of this industry as possible before it was uh, finished, which it did finish in about 76, 1976. Um, so there we have a dolly, a block, uh, a log loaded into the floor, set into the floor about a foot, 14 inches of the floor, and that anvil is chained to it, and the tools are then set into that anvil 
according to what diameter of uh, the chain that you're working on. I'll just put a few slides on to show the operation that uh, goes on. Everything's bigger, of course. The tongues are bigger, the hammers are bigger, the boshes at the front are bigger, and the hearth is bigger. It's a central hearth in the middle of the shop, usually. And you can see the, the striker is bending the first bend. Uh, this is about an inch and a quarter diameter, that is, uh, to make the chain. You can see now with the sledgehammer, he's scarfing it out, he's taping out both ends. Uh, a good view there of the, the dolly. We have the uh, sort of a bicken at the front there with the, uh, the groove to suit the diameter of the chain. The second groove, of course, is if you're putting a, a stud in for Admiral to use for anchor. For, for anchoring chain, uh, the Admiralty will not allow any flats on their chain and so you must have a groove to maintain the diameter of the iron. And you can also see on the right hand side the, the dolly box which holds the top tool and the springs which uh, keep it in place. There you can see now they're both hammering away, they're shutting the link, but I think it is there, they're, they're making a chain link there. Uh, it's held on by a little slave chain on the left, you can see, and there's three, three or four legs uh, that's got to be made to a certain length uh, to work on a crane. Uh, and the striker on the right, Clary, is hammering away, and then Tony on the left is hammering away with his large sledgehammer, and they're shutting the link, they're closing the link, uh, welding the, the, the joint together. Onto the bicken then, and now it's welded, they're taking out as much of that uh, waste material as possible. And you can see he's using a pair of nipple tongs to move it round while Tony on the right hand side is hammering away with his sledgehammer to uh, um, clean up the, the link as much as possible before he puts the top tool down. There's the top tool now, it's been put in position and the blows are then rained on top of that tool while the smith moves it around to smooth up the, uh, the link. And you can see just to the left of it, the finished links, um, they're a beautiful job really, they, they smooth it out and bring it back to its original diameter. And uh, a lot of them will challenge anyone when it's cooled down and it's all a single blue colour to find out, to tell, point out which end has been uh, welded. We also find that I've been talking to these chain makers in No Bloomers over the years. I used to go up there and talk, chat to them and record them on a Saturday morning. Uh, that they can go onto a, onto a, a, a harbour or a docks and see chain and they would be able to tell who's welded it. They say, oh, Tommy Smith has welded that or Jack Bills has welded that because I can tell his weld, I can tell his joint, you know. And it's amazing how they leave their own personal trademark on the links. That's okay then up to about inch and 15, 16th, just under two inches. Over that, for convenience, they weld the links on the side and so they call it side welded. And so from two inch upwards, they weld the links on the side. Uh, a bit of help here, you see the yard man cuts the uh, top left hand corner, cuts the metal uh, at an angle. It's then passed on to uh, a furnace that heats it up and puts it into that eccentric mandle which does one turn and bends it into the shape of the link. This comes out as you can see on the bottom left hand side just above that double handed hammer which is called a johnny by the way and you can rain heavy blows with that. Uh, it's opened out a little bit and then threaded into the last link, reheated and it's welded on the side, usually two welds both sides and finished off on that stake block you can see in the centre. Um, the leader of the gang uh, usually uses a, a hollow tool or the swage you can see on the right to run it across the top while they rain blows on it to smooth out the link on the top and the sides to finish off the, uh, the, the job. You can see a little drawing just to the left of the stake block of a, a hammer with three handles. Now I, I kept finding references to this. Uh, it was called a Monday hammer because they said nobody likes Mondays either and nobody likes to use a Monday hammer because it was a hundred weight and a quarter or 140 pounds and usually five men operated it, three on the handles and two at the front to give it a lift up. There you can see a, a Johnny being used by, used by two men and the smith is running the hollow tool across the top to finish off a link on the side welding. Uh, nice bit of chain that, it's probably about three inches that is I should think. There you can see quite a large chain, that is actually three and a quarter diameter. 
And this is a typical team, five men. On the right hand side, Ben Hodgetts, who was known as the King of Chain Makers. Um, and the chain they're working on there, of course, is the chain for the Titanic. This was made at Noah Hingley's, about 100 tonne of this chain was made, and it's three and a quarter diameter. And there were about five hours oh, or five fires involved in making it, but this was a, a shot of just one of the fires uh, making the chain. And we usually find in these gangs that there's usually relatives, brothers, sons, son-in-laws and so on, cousins. They usually teach the trade to the relatives, but not to a stranger. So you find these gangs are usually related. And this is reflected in the lists when I'm... I get requests from all over the world to trace people who've worked at Noah Hingley's or in various firms in the Cradleith area and I look at the union lists and you find men of the same name uh, in these gangs uh, making this large chain. I thought I'd just pop on this one of the large anchor that was made uh, at, uh, well it was actually made at a couple of places, machined at Noah Hingley's and assembled at Lloyd's Test House. But there's the large 16 tonne anchor which was also made for the Titanic. It's been tested and it's ready to be taken off to Dudley, to be put on the train to go to Holland and Wolford, Belfast to be put on the ill-fated Titanic. Uh, and if you just note that nice decorative bracket under the uh, inspector's office there, that you can still see that today if you go to Primrose Hill, uh, the works is still there. I still get requests from parties to take them into Lloyd's Test to, to show them and uh, they can still go in and find remains of the fact that that was the top test house in England and the headquarters of Lloyd's Test. Again, you can see there's eight horses on that uh, wagon. Those were Hingley's horses. I think that's one of the Hingley's by the uh, anchor with a bowler hat on. And tw 12 horses bought that wagon from Great Bridge. And they were apparently, you know, to, to miss Hingley's words, they were not quite strong enough to do the job so you put this I'll put uh, eight of my horses on they all weighed over a ton and as you know in the black country they're called bonkosses you know a very large horse and Hingley loved his horses and used them right up to into the 60s to move chain about even when everyone else was using traction engines and lorries he was still using his horses you see these photographs of 20 horses on this uh, pulling this this anchor and that was because the other 12 had to get back to Great Bridge and so they anchored them on the front there with a, a single chain and all these photographs show 20 horses going up towards Netherton although only eight were needed really to uh, get it to the, to the yard of Dudley to be put onto the London North Western Railway. I was searching for years to find a, a photograph of one of these three handled hammers and uh, I found this one, and there you can see it's a massive thing, uh, 100 weight and a quarter, 140 pound. And this gang, we think, we're using it to make the square link chain you can see on the far right hand side by a gentleman's foot. This was a, a square link chain used for mooring in harbours uh, for battleships and large ships and so on, ground moorings they use that for. And many firms in this area actually made it. This is a shot of, uh, I think Noah Hingley is making that chain. You can see the size of the link now, four and a quarter square. And the, the requirement was it must be three foot clear or three foot and a quarter clear in the centre. So it was quite a large link. But they usually made it four and a quarter, four and a half square in the centre and usually about five inches on the end to stand up a bit of wear. And you can see the links are pre-made there. They have to be joined by, probably by not all that gang, I think they just wanted to get on the photograph. But you can see that uh, they'd be joined together with that steam hammer in the background uh, to form a, a large link. And again, that had to be tested, so it's quite a job to get something like that tested. <laughs> Railway couplings were another job that were tackled by a lot of firms in this area. Uh, and I had permission to search around uh, uh, the Seven Valley Railway Builder. We did some chain joining for them. and. I had permission to go around and I had a job to find a wrought iron uh, chain uh, 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 truck coupling really, a three link coupling. Um, but that was one I found because they're mostly all butt welded steel couplings today. The bottom one on the right you can see uh, as uh, ge was gauged, you can see it got two flats on so you could drop it into the, the coupling hook without taking the whole hook off the wagon or the truck as you used to in the old days. So that was a, as it's been well worn, it's been pulled out of shape, uh, but that was one that I was able to record down at uh, Budley. I also uh, recorded, managed to find this illustration of men working on a railway coupling and you can see there the 
the smith is taking his hollow tool across the top because the long link they have to weld it on the side special tool in the uh, in the dolly you can see as well and the smithy raining blows on it so a slightly different operation when you're making these railway coupling again very important job lives depended on it and so it was entrusted to the the skilled men of Cradley Heath to, to make these couplings most chain if it's got to be used for a, a purpose has to be tested most firms had their own little test beds you wanted a test bed ideally 90 foot long, 15 fathoms long, to test your chain. And it was tested in that cast iron groove uh, that you can see in the center of the photograph. Most works had their own little test bed, but uh, any chain that was made for any of the large liners or um, the Admiralty, they specified that it must have a Lloyd's certificate. But uh, a lot of chain, people did their own chain testing in their own works, and this is no bloomer's little test bed. This is the uh, Lloyd's test at Primrose Hill. You can see those brackets now just under the engineer's office. They're still in position. They're still in position when you go up today. Uh, and this is, was the headquarters of Lloyd's British testing. And you can see they've got some strange looking anchors on the side of the canal there. Now English who were a little farther along the canal used to transport their heavy chain by canal boat to that little dock and offload it with a crane which went, a steam driven crane which ran along on rails and took it into the works to be tested and all the chain that was needed as a certificate had to be tested there. Inside there you can see a typical Lloyd's test shop. Uh, Lloyd specified there must be tons of daylight, you can see windows in the ends, the roofs, the sides a lot so that the any fault in that chain, you can see the men standing in the, the groove on the left, they're testing the chain. They're turning over every link, every link must be turned over with a bar to make sure that it, the joint doesn't come apart. Uh, you can also see that the, uh, there's a, a cover held by those chains going up into the roof over the test groove so that if the chain does uh, break when it's pulled, it's tensile pulled to the required load, if it does break it's contained in that groove and this is a dead giveaway if you go into the uh, works today although it's a steel stockholders and the the floor has been concreted over you can still see those little pulley wheels up in the roof you can also see uh, the top of one of those joining hearths in the on the right hand side there where the men uh, would rejoin chain because one of the specifications was you can take a yard or three links of chain from any part of that chain link and test it to breaking strain and then if it didn't break it would be reattached to the chain link and tested to its full working load uh, and those men would be the people who joined it back together again. When I go to different parts of the country people are amazed that women made chain. So many women were involved, thousands of women were, made, were made chain in this area and this is a typical uh, women's chain shop within yards of where we are at the moment actually in Old Hill, Oak Street Old Hill where you can see there's six or seven women there making chain, a blacksmith on the left to do repairs to his tongs and any tools and the gaffer's son kneeling in the front of the, on the floor of the shop posing obviously for a photograph and you can also see that these girls have to pump their own bellows for the blast, you can see the little handles there on the on the hearth and you also see the small chain that they uh, were making at the time. Also the loose brick floor which was typical of chain shops. Uh, again, if you come to Mushroom Green, we fought to retain the loose brick floor there because the restorers wanted to put a, a plain concrete floor in. Um, this shop we managed to locate, I think it's probably been demolished now, but in the 70s, this was an electrical store and we managed to locate it. There's a, a round top window at the back there that we was bricked up, but we managed to locate that and also the outline of the halls along the wall they were easily recognisable. <laughs> Women's tools again are different. Uh, there's a box full of ash or cinder and uh, a block which is about four inches deep which contain all their tools. They work from the bar, in other words they, the, the metal is not cut for them. They don't very often go up to 3.8, usually below 3.8 that they work, but quite small chain as well. They made the communication cord uh, chain for trains, the emergency stopping on chain on trains. Um, so you can see there the hardy or the cutter, the little chisel set in the block. Uh, the metal is almost cut through by putting the hot metal against the gauge which has been set to the length that they want. 
they then bend it a little bit on the swage and then do the other uh, operations on the point, uh, heat it up and bring it up to welding heat when they've joined up of course to the original length and then hammer it out and then twist it by putting the link in the twister and putting the dog on the tongs and twisting it. So that was a typical sort of women's uh, set of tools and we have a set of tools like this down Mushroom Green, probably the only set left probably in the world really because any time the BBC want to make a film they come and borrow them and uh, bring them back fortunately. The government asked for a list of chain, small chain making workshops in England and Wales um, and they did this, uh, this research in 1911 and uh, they found out that in the whole of England and Wales there were 939 chain workshops. Now this is a small workshop, Brewhouse Chain Shop or small family workshop, not the large works. And out of that 939, 918 were to be found in the area shown on that map, which is Netherton, Quarrybank, Cradley, Cradley Heath and Old Hill. And out of that 900 odd chain shops there's only a handful left at the moment. Uh, and they're quickly uh, going down every, every week, uh, we're losing a chance, or we're fighting to save as many as we can, but they are being demolished. And you see that's an area of about two and a half by three miles, 2.4 by 2.8 miles in area, and most of those chain shops could be found in that area. I was very fortunate to, uh, we were on a course down at Breck and we went into an old water mill, and you can see the wear on that uh, bag band, obviously made by women chain makers, and you can see the links are almost worn through in places. And so it's obviously done a great job, but has never failed, but uh, it wouldn't be worth risking on, uh, on a cart now, but it just shows what, they, what strain they will take when they're using them. That was a typical sort of job for a, a women chain maker and I found a list in 1900 where they got about one and tuppence for making one of those. You can see a back band now in place over that uh, saddle tree at Kidderminster when they have the, the horses out at the Seven Valley Railway and you can see it fits over this, uh, the saddle tree and fits down onto to hold the two, um, the two towing uh, bars or you know the two wood bars there to uh, hold the, uh, the wagon. Uh, and then he's towed by, you know, he has a, a collar to do the pulling and a, a band around his backside there like to provide the braking. But the cart is held up by the, the bag band which fits over the top of that, uh, that uh, saddle tree there. I was very fortunate to be able to photograph the last lady chain maker who was Lucy Woodall at uh, Samuel Woodhouse at Corngreaves. Here you can see she's making twisted chain. You can also see the tools there. The, the, the uh, chisel and the uh, and the hardy and the uh, the, the bending um, ring and the the blocks she's working on uh, and she's making twisted chains. She's just shutting the link there. She was the last lady in the shop. She worked for 60 years and one month making chains. She started when she was 13 and finished in nine, when she was 73. And then only because uh, the arthritis was uh, getting rather painful working in damp conditions uh, at the hearth, heat and water, steam. She's got the luxury of course, you can see they have electrically blown fire, electric blower would be blowing that fire. Fire of course, fueled by washed breeze which is a small washed coke. Right so Lucy Woodall retired in 73, six years later unfortunately she'd uh, died and um, her son uh, who I still, uh, Trevor, who I still, uh, still uh, chat to, I was chatting to him the other day, he had that chain put onto a, on a, 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 a stone in Park Lane churchyard uh, when she was buried there. And you can also see from that uh, gravestone that uh, her husband, uh, who contacted some problems with uh, uh, leg ulcers, you know, while working down the pit, died in 1932, so she had to bring up her son on her own. Typical uh, Brewhouse chain shop in uh, Hall Street in Old Hill. Uh, you can see the, first of all, the groove on the windowsill where the bars have been pushed through when they're delivered by the, the delivery man delivering the bars of iron. She would then work from the bars of iron. You can see them leaning against the right hand side of the sill. Uh, you also see she's pumping a horseshoe bellows to provide the blast to bring it up to welding heat and her tools are just behind her. But this is a typical little Brewhouse chain shop uh, that you would find behind many, many houses in the black country. 
brew house chain shop we found in Lawrence Lane, which we thought they'd all gone in the uh, in the in the uh, in the twenties actually, uh, a, a shop where you could find the sink and the uh, a, a, a brew uh, place where they did the brewing and the washing and the bread making. Bread making chimney on the left, two hawes, and just over the other side of the roof the uh, chimney for the boiling in the copper for brewing or doing the washing. Just over the fold from the house, I was able to make a drawing of. Uh, this uh, shop and um, show the different positions of the different uh, tools. From the photographs that I did of the uh, this brew house chain shop I was able to uh, do this little sketch, this little drawing to show the features of it. Um, you can see now there's just a little fold or a little yard between the house and the entrance to the brew house, a very low sink, uh, a copper boiler up the corner where she would do a washing or brew a beer with a fire underneath you can see. Uh, a little hearth east side where they can make chain and then at the back office not shown is a, a bread oven where she would make uh, bread and you can see the women kept quite busy making the chain and uh, during the day and then getting the kids off to school and the men off to work and then they would also make a bit of chain at night so they were very busy in the back country making the small chain just to eke out the uh, income for the for the household of course. Huey Chapman, of course, an amateur artist uh, who created the electrical stores at Old Hill. He worked as a crane driver at Noah Hingley's and has, de has made, done several paintings himself of, uh, the connected with the chain industry. And this is the one that he did of Lucy Woodall, working in a little chain shop to try to pass, over, you know, to pass on the, all the features that we know about uh, the women chain shops. The man delivering the bath through the window, you know, the hollyhocks outside, the, the cat sitting on the windowsill, the baby being rocked to sleep on the bellows as the pumps the bellows, and the women, of course, working away on the, the block. The kiddies, of course, playing in the chain shop because there was no nurseries in those days. You had to take the kiddies to work with you if they uh, weren't old enough to go to school. And, of course, the, the family pets, they were always there as well. So that is a, a nice, typical scene of... Uh, a uh, little brew house chain shop uh, as created by Ewan Chapman. <laughs> Mentioning Chapman's uh, just behind the, the shop and not far away but since demolished of course was a typical women's chain shop with uh, what about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about ten halls in there I should think where the women would work um, making chain. I think at one time Lucy Woodall did work there for the spell as well. And there was another chain shop to the left of it and another one in front of it. So quite a gathering of chain shops in that area. Uh, and this is just between uh, sort of Cradle Heath and Old Hill. <laughs> I've managed to collect quite a few of these photographs and I always say if there's no health and safety at work offices in the uh, audience, well, I don't, I don't, how do we get on with this? I don't know, but there you can see the women working away in the shop with the kiddies running around and you can see the woman on the right hand side won't even stop for the photographer. She's quite blurred, you know, she's hammering away making chain and those kiddies are amongst all the sparks and the dirt and the filth and everything. So again, just to illustrate that the kiddies and you can see why they started work early. I mean, Mick uh, was making chain when he was eight years old when he came from school, you know, so he got a good uh, grounding before he left school how to make a chain link. <laughs> I found this marvellous illustration in Cosley Record when I do some research um, of a, an engraving of um, a woman chain maker. And you'll see just down below, you can just see Cradley Heath mentioned down there. And the woman is probably cutting the bar in two because bars were delivered to them about 12, 14 foot long and the first thing was to chop them in two so they could work with a manageable six or seven feet long uh, bar. But there you can see a, a nice illustration of women at work uh, in Cradley Heath uh, making chain. Uh, I wrote to various places to get permission to use this and uh, after many letters from London up to Manchester and so on, I managed to get permission to be able to make a slide of this and use it at, uh, at shows. And I get lots of students coming to me researching the women's chain industry and realising very quickly that there's very little been recorded in the libraries. And uh, the one that came to me last year uh, sent me a copy of her dissertation for a degree and this was on the front. It moved her that much, I think, that she used it for the title page on the front of the dissertation. Again, I occasionally locate real photographs, not posed. You can see one in uh, not far away in Plant Street, Old Hill, actually, where uh, this, uh, these women were photographed by 
a local paper making chain and there's quite a gathering of women's chain shops in Plan Street. Uh, it, it, I, I found it referred to in the 1859 journal as a they, they were slaving away for a, a pittance and again you can weigh this up when 1912 they went out on strike because the trade boards had guaranteed them or said they should be getting at least tuppence halfpenny an hour which is one new penny today and the employers refused to pay them and so the, there was a lockout and uh, Mary MacArthur came up from London and you probably know all the story where she led them in the strike and the lockout and uh, managed to get them this tuppence halfpenny an hour which meant a rise of 150 percent to some of them so these poor women were working away making chains uh, for a pittance. Again, this was uh, um, identified the both the women, and you can see it was lovingly carried in her wallet, you know, folded over. I managed to borrow it, copy it, and take it back to you know within an hour because they, they don't like to let these things out of the sight. And you can see that the, this woman is making twisted agricultural chain. A very good view of a twister as well, just in front of the hammer. <laughs> chain shops have changed quite a lot. Then this is a modern chain shop. Uh, coil of steel is delivered on the left. Uh, dropped onto the, the bobbin there, it is fed through, straightened, cut off, bent, uh, interleaved and then dropped down just in front of the machine ready for welding. This is the modern method of making electrically welded uh, steel chain. You can also see going up to the left of the picture the finished article, or probably going off ready to be welded. There you can see it's electrically welded on these machines, women again involved, watching them, minding them. Uh, and the machine welds every other link because it welds the one that, which is standing up for convenience. So they either pass them through twice or have two machines side by side which will weld every link as it's going through. Um, the the uh, metal is pushed together. I think I've got a slide here. The metal is pushed together and the heat comes on and it's welded and then the dies come in, squeeze it and you can see just above that boss on the right hand side, in the most right centre, the spare metal uh, which is left over passes down uh, a little lower and is sheared off by that tool, you can see the tool in the centre of the, the, the slide, is sheared off and uh, you can see the links passing through now. There's just that little telltale connection in the centre and this is modern electrically welded chain. All chain is made like this now, the small chain. Um, it's very good for pulley blocks of course because it's all uniform. Uh, in the old days they'd have a special block uh, making uh, union which uh, looked after men who made block chain which had to be a uniform in length to work on pulley blocks but of course the modern chain is identical anyway so it, uh, it fits very nicely. Large chain took a little bit longer to develop. Samuel Taylor of Briley Hill, he experimented quite a long while before he developed his very marvellous Taiko chain and you can see he's drop forged alloy steel chain link at the top. He either forged the uh, half links or cut the large links in two and then cut through the center half stud, opened them up when they were hot, put them together and closed them up again and welded down the center. You can see on the bottom illustration in red you can see where the link is welded. So you get one link welder, then each side is a solid link. This is very, very strong chain, supplied to all the Queen liners, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth and so on, uh, and Britannia, and all lots of Navy ships during the war, uh, they just could not make enough of it. Uh, Smetic Drop Forge on the Southport Road, they were making this chain under contract for, for the Navy, but it's a very expensive chain, very strong chain, and it's not made today. Um, there's a length of this chain down at uh, Samuel Taylor's old test bed, which is now Lloyd's, of course, at Briley Hill, and I've been down there, and it's used to um, to set up the chain test. Uh, although it's 60 years old, you can still set up your chain test with it, uh, knowing that it's very reliable and does not move. Uh, Lloyd's have admitted if they were asked to test it to breaking strain, it would break the machine first. Uh, it is probably the strongest chain ever made. There you can see the drop forged link with the uh, excess still on it, the, the, the flash still on it waiting to be clipped off, but there you can see the Taiko link, beautiful shaped link, uh, just been forged. I was amazed as well when I found all the uh, 
uh, lots of photographs, they actually turned inside the link and the, a, lot of, a lot of work was done machining these links to make them fit and, and work together nicely. And then the last operation, of course, was welding the link. There you can see the massive machine which is used. This was the Queen Mary chain, which is about four and a quarter diameter. And you can see the size by that man on the right hand side. The link was temporarily held together by that little metal clip, passed over, welded, and you can see it passing out through the bottom of the, uh, the, the machine. Uh, to go for a statutory test, but everybody knew that uh, n n never has this chain failed a test and uh, it's still on a lot of the liners at the moment as well. And if you go down to the Belfast in London, you'll still find a length or two of this uh, holding the, the anchors down the, on their decks. There's a, a couple of three links which are photographed down at uh, Lloyd's, which of course is Samuel Taylor's old works, and uh, you can see it's a beautiful shape link and uh, nicely designed and does a marvellous job. Another type of link that was made, um, it was found that when you made this, the link with a separate stud in and it was used in the typhoon uh, atmosphere out in Far East uh, or even in the North Sea later on in the oil rigs, uh, the, the, the sea was so vicious during the winter that it would actually jerk the stud out and so the link would become solid when the strain came on and um, it would be useless as a flexible connection. And so this chain was invented again during the war, used on many battleships and warships again, integral stud chain by Griffin Woodhouses down by Cradley Station. And there you can see that the stud is actually forged on the bar before it's uh, welded, before it's actually bent and welded. And so that stud will never come off because it's actually part of the, uh, the metal. There you can see a beacon type pull again, you know, but hydraulic this time, pulling the, 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 the link in and, and bending it and the still two men needed to swing the link in and connect it up before it finally comes round and, and joins up, then goes up through the asbestos lined uh, uh, cover back to the welding machine at the back to be welded. You can see just above the stud on that uh, on the left hand side of the, uh, the link, you can just see the line where it's got to be welded, butt welded. The welding machine at the back then is going through and welding it. It has to be normalised and uh, tested and uh, paint, dropped in the paint, the black tar usually, something like that, and off it goes to the customer, out in the Far East usually, because it's a very good chain for resisting the vicious uh, typhoons they get out there. Chain today then is made on the carousel principle, as you can see here, at Lloyd's which is the old Sammy Taylor's shop. And you can see that uh, the operations are all carried out on this carousel machine. The um, station at the back, the far one behind the centre pivot, pivot is uh, heats up the metal, the next one bends it, the one on the left then um, boils it together, you can see the sparks coming out. Then it comes round to the gentleman at the front who chips off the excess metal, you can see the waste metal on the floor. And then he goes round to the last gentleman uh, who inserts the stud. As you can see, that stud chain, so he inserts the stud and it's closed up hydraulically to make it into cable chain. When each one has finished their operation, uh, as you can see, they're all going on simultaneously with the operations. They put a foot on the on a button, and when every button has been pressed, the carousel will move around one position, and the chain is moved up one turn and drops into the centre. So this is the modern method of making chain, right from the a minesweeper right up to the aircraft carriers, which they make for the MOD down at uh, Briley Hill today. There you can see the uh, operation of bending where the, uh, again, hydraulic power and similar tools to what we always use for making chain, where the, uh, the metal is uh, bent around a former uh, to create that nice shape. You can also see where it's welded on the side, in this case, because it's butt welded, more convenient to weld on the side, and very little uh, human attention needed, apart from pressing the levers and pressing the buttons to create it. If you're on a mine sweeper or a mine hunter, you don't want steel chain to attract a mine. Uh, and so they use some sort of a non-magnetic metal, such as bronze or something like that. Uh, I've been on two ships down at uh, Portsmouth and uh, where everybody else goes downstairs to the, to the cruise quarters or the engines or the, uh, uh, see the bridge or something like that, I make my way 
get with permission across to the front to see what sort of anchoring gear he's got on. And I, and I used to go on these minesweepers and I was shocked to find out that they got cast bronze chain on. And of course I was closely followed by a petty officer usually and I would say to him, well this looks like cast, cast chain to me. He says, it is sir. I said, well surely the first pull on your anchor, snatch on an anchor will break this. He says, it does sir. You know. Mm. Uh, and so I said, well, we have created at, uh, in the black country, butt welded silicon aluminium bronze chain. And there you can see the finished article in front of you. Uh, created again at uh, Samuel Taylor at Lloyd's Briley Hill. And uh, not only created, but if you join non ferrous metal, bronze, brass or anything, you all know you use silver soldering or something like that. This is butt welded with electricity, you know. They have really worked hard to perfect this chain. So much so, as soon as it was approved by the Admiralty, the Admiralty gradually brought in all our mine sweepers and mine hunters and equipped them with this chain, 90 foot length of this chain. Very expensive, but of course, most essential when you're on a, a mine sweeper. I have got three links of this at home. Um, I was awarded this because I was in on the sort of perfection of it and uh, I went down to Terry, the foreman down there, with the manager down there, and he said, we've got it past now, Ron. And I said, well, that's beautiful, that chain. And he said, would you like that? I said, I should love it. Like offering me a new car. Somebody offers me a length of this. It's 26 millimetres, just over one inch diameter. And he said, I'll get it shot blasted for you. And I brought that home gleefully and put it upstairs in my collection. Unfortunately, I did a talk at a, a golf course, the other side, Cannock, a couple of years ago, and I mentioned this, and the gentleman who gave the vote of thanks at the end said, I've always wanted to meet a man who keeps change in his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, again, the continental people, the Spanish navies and so on, they don't want to pay for this bronze chain, the silicon aluminium bronze chain. They want stainless steel chain, non-magnetic stainless steel. So, again, we've perfected down at Samuel Taylor's at Lloyd's. Welding, again, it's not very easy to butt weld stainless steel, as you probably all know. Uh, and so um, this is, in the front is a normal piece of chain. Uh, behind it is a piece of chain which has been tested to its breaking uh, strain. Well, actually to destruction that's been tested. Uh, you can see how it's elongated. You can see how the link on the left is actually broken, but not on the join, on the metal itself, to show that the metal has broken before the join, uh, showing it is a good chain. And this is the sort that the, the chain that the uh, foreign navies want today. Very few chain shops, I say, left in the black country. This is a, a mushroom green chain shop which we've, we tried to save, fought to save, and managed to save, and got it rebuilt. Uh, and we demonstrate and show handmade chain to visitors on the first Sunday in the month from April to October. Uh, a nice chain shop with the correct chimneys, brick on edge chimneys and tie bars again, minus subsidence, barred window. This is before it was rebuilt by the way. Uh, and the house next door of course in front, uh, behind it, is the uh, Kendricks uh, house. Uh, Harry Kendrick of course ran this chain shop. It's actually William Kendrick, the name of the firm, but Harry Kendrick ran it until 65, 1965 when he died. And then we managed to save it and it was open to the public in 1977. And we've just opened, we open every season now in April for uh, showing the general public. And they come from far and wide to see the skills of the handmade chain maker. It's also used by schools. This uh, uh, is a, a photograph of Collie Lane schools. They come down here quite regularly. They have been doing for the last five years because under the national curriculum they have to study the local trades. Uh, and one of them, of course, at Cradley, in fact, the main one at Cradley was making chain by hand. And you can see now the chain looks much smarter. It's been rebuilt, retiled, and uh, the children come down to see a chain maker at work and marvel uh, at the experience uh, of seeing hot metal turning into chain links. I'm reading a book about it. At Mushroom Green, of course, we, uh, we make chain and this is what they see and this is, uh, we also make chain for traction engine owners for searing chain uh, and also we are now making it for Christ Tramway Museum for braking chain for their trams. Here we see Mick, he's joining up a, 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 an eye bolt to a, a link uh, which has got to go on to a, a traction engine and uh, this is what, when we demonstrate now, we just don't make chain and throw it on the floor. Uh, demonstration pieces, we actually make chain and it is used uh, so it is serving a purpose. 
Anyone who hasn't seen chain uh, in this position, there we see the chain fitted on a traction engine. We made this one for a traction engine down at Kidderminster and went down and tried it out and fitted it on. And there we can see it in position. One of the few chain shops left now in Bannister Street, Cradley Heath. Again, I've been trying to save this. Uh, or get some grant to try and save it. This is safe at the moment. Uh, typical stable door, half door, and just inside that door on the right hand side is a, a Tommy Hammer set up with all its tools. Um, and I often take visitors around there when I take them for uh, summer walks in the evening sort of thing and the gentleman who owns it he very kindly comes up from King, Kingswin, oh, from Kimber sorry from Kimber and opens up for us and I usually go ahead and he usually says how many tonight Ron I usually say 80 or 90 he says, oh dear you know and he's got to try and get uh, a filter you've got to try and filter 80 or 90 people in that little shop which is a sort of a, a six half shop for a, fam a family shop uh, you've got to try and fit those in uh, and not interrupt the, the walk too much Bannister Street, of course, named after Bannister's Chain Works, which was just over the wall at the back. Uh, very large, very early chain works, uh, had their own test shop, and we think the very first chain was tested there uh, from Noah Hingley's Works, which was on the other side of the road originally at Newtown. Not far from where those women were making chain in Plant Street, they moved the road over and put a nice little Reminder of the industry uh, for us, when you're coming up from Cradle Heath to Old Hill, we have this little succession of links in the wall, and the building at the back, of course, has got uh, an anchor and chain in that. Um, and so uh, we've got just a little reminder of the industry. Uh, over the other side of the road, Pant Street, was where those poor women slaved away, uh, sort of making chain. When you're doing research into the chain industry, you come across a few tales. Um, one of them I found uh, in a book by Clive Brooks on uh, Atlantic Queens, uh, where he talks about the names of Cunard liners and, and uh, White Star liners and various other lines, actually. And I was amazed when I read it that all these, uh, these, these large uh, shipping lines named their ships with the last two letters uh, being the same. If I can just read out a couple of three of the Cunard ships, uh, Ascania, Saxonia, Mauritania, all ending in IA, Samaria, Parthia, Scythia, Media, Franconia, Caronia, and whereby the, the White Star Line ended all theirs in IC, Belgic, Germanic, Britannic, Gothic, Doric, Majestic, Gorgic, or oh, sorry, Georgic, and Titanic, all ending in IC. Um, we, he also tells a tale of about an 80,000 ton liner where the keel was laid down in December 1931 and it was known as Hall number 534 at John Brown's shipyard on the Clyde Bank. Mm. December 11th 1931 came the depression, work was stopped on the, uh, on the liner and the workers were sent home. The government decided that Hall number 534 should receive assistance from public funds and to get the men back to work and get them off the dole. So the men went back to work and money was lent uh, on favourable terms and Mr Chamberlain insisted that Cunard merge with White Star uh, to finish the ship off. So obviously we had to find a name for the ship. So it, does it end in IA or IC? So obviously they tossed up or something like that and it looks as if the, uh, the uh, Cunard won because they said we will call it Victoria ending in IA. So anyway, I think March 34, the men returned to work, and, and in September uh, 34, hall number 534 was ready for launching. And I say the name agreed was Victoria. Uh, the committee that uh, sat and uh, managed this ship sort of thing, and the building of it, and the naming of it, and launching of it, and all these lot, the one member said, if you're going to um, name it after a member of the royal family, you must surely get permission from the present royal family. And so Lord Royden, who was a personal friend of King George V, was detailed to ask royal permission to name the ship. So while they were out grouse shooting with the royal party, Lord Royden says to His Majesty, Would His Majesty consent to the great liner being named after the most illustrious and remarkable woman who has ever been Queen of England? He really dropped himself in it, because the King replied, That is the greatest compliment that has ever been made to me or my wife. I ask her permission when we get home. So that's a name it the Queen Mary, as this gentleman rightly said. So the ship uh, was launched, it fitted with Samuel Taylor chain, 
uh, and show another connection with the black country. And that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs>